David did his undergraduate work at University of California, Davis, and uh, his JD is from University of California, Berkeley's uh, Bolt Hall. And he is a specialist in bankruptcy and representing creditors as well as uh, one of the leading experts on water law, which uh, these days is critically important in California, maybe always has been in the West. Uh, but so let me start off, uh, David, by asking, so you've been managing uh, Alan Matkins through the recession, but also through all of this uh, transition to new technologies. And uh, maybe in addition to telling us a little more about Alan Matkins, what has been your experience with this and what does it mean for uh, the kinds of folks that you're going to be looking for 10 years from now, for example, um, you know, the, the title of the conference is, uh, will C3PO be your next associate? Okay, so uh, we're not at this scale yet, and scale is a new paradigm for law firms, which I'll come back to, but at least two law firms have uh, already uh, contracted with IBM for Watson uh, as a research tool instead of an associate. They, they didn't say the last part, but the associates know that. Uh, whether it'll work or not uh, remains to be seen. The answer is, of course, it will work eventually. Uh, the pace will be there. So to, to cut to the long-term future and depress everybody, because I, I found the, the last speaker's presentation fascinating, uh, I was at another one of these conferences uh, whose speakers I can't remember, so either I'd give him attribution, but he, he told us the following. In the distant future, in a services firm, there will actually be only two employees. One will be a person, and one will be a dog. The person's job will be to feed the dog. <laughs> <laughs> the dog's job is to keep the person from touching the machines. <laughs> um, th that's where robotics goes if you believe everything you read and watch science fiction. Now, they will be mating, in which case eventually they'll eliminate the person, and, and the other machines will feed the dog. So what's happening in the legal industry? First, I have to say that's uh, managing law firms uh, is, is very much like any other professional service firm, except that we're not nearly as popular, apparently, in the, in, in the media or anywhere else. Lawyer jokes, you don't hear a lot about accounting jokes or anything else. Um, and it's been a period of immense change, um, and not surprising law firms, given their sort of risk-averse training as lawyers, uh, are at the trailing edge of change, not the leading edge. So we're not really innovators in a technology sense. The, but things are happening in industry which technology is assisting, which I'll run through real quickly, and then I'll go to how technology is changing law firms. Uh, when I started practicing law in 1979, uh, a large law firm in the United States, which had the largest law firms in the world, was 100 to 200 lawyers and maybe one to three offices. Okay. So in my lifetime of practice, which is 30-something years, the largest law firm now is 7,300 lawyers with offices in 125 countries. Th that scale is dramatically different. Law is no longer, in that firm, a local proposition, although they depend upon local knowledge. Um, I'll come back to that. Um, that wouldn't be possible in the old days because you couldn't do a conflicts check. You need a computer and a database to see if you're about to take a matter on somewhere that's adverse to a client that's somewhere else. So although that's not viewed as technologically driven, in fact, it's technologically enabled. Uh, second, since the recession especially, uh, the number of, of uh, baby boomers who have yet to retire, um, the continuing supply from top quality law schools of legal graduates that outnumber the, the job market um, and technology uh, has created a shift in the marketplace where for law firms servicing the business community, uh, it's a buyer's market with respect to pricing. Um, used to be year over year compound rate growth of five plus percent. We're now at 2%. Uh, and many clients it's 0%. Um, we have much more transparency. We have much less client loyalty uh, because, again, technology has assisted them in figuring out what things cost. 
um, and we have much more partner mobility. So those, that, that's a very big problem that law firm management is trying to address now. And to compound it, no pun intended, uh, the best law students are coming out of law schools uh, with huge amounts of debt. Doesn't matter whether to go to Berkeley now or Stanford. When I went, the, the differential was, like Stanford was seven times as expensive, now it's a couple thousand dollars more expensive. Um, and that debt is steering talent to those who have a scale that can afford to lose money on a few employees because they'll hire 100. And if they get 95 of them right, great. Whereas we'll hire five. We have to get all five right, otherwise one wrong is a 20% miss. Um, and so pricing at the bottom now is, and meaning compensation, is very competitive uh, because debt growth for graduates. And least important, but still substantial, is how technology is changing our office, which is what the topic is, so I'll get to it. Um, it's uh, changing the following things, three, th following five things, and if I can touch on each of them in my time, I will, but uh, I'll try to hurry through. It changes how we're doing things. That's probably uh, self-evident, but I'll give some interesting examples, maybe. Uh, it changes where we do things. It changes when we do things. It changes what we use as uh, information sources. Uh, and frankly, ultimately, it's changing what we do for clients uh, and what we don't do for clients. So uh, how we do things, that's always been changing. If you think back to every movie you've ever seen, there was a lawyer with a giant table in front of him, open books that are hardbacked, you know, reading cases and taking notes. And those people, a few of them, still working by law firm. But, you know, today we have obviously computer-aided research, et cetera. We used to have uh, typewriters with carbons. You know, we have word processing with, with copy machines. So how we produce uh, is uh, much uh, influenced by technology as it always has. The pace is faster now. Um, and so examples that might be of interest, we now have smart templates that with software, so they're not robots, ask clients questions to help fill out drafts, uh, driving down the cost of services and increasing the, the uh, interest of the person who actually does the work. Um, where we do things, um, well, everywhere now, you have to be remotely connected because a client from anywhere at any time will want immediately, immediate response. Um, so the, the mobile lawyer is reality. I have all my emails come to my phone. I, have, I, mean, I, can, I can write a letter, use a document out of our internal system all off my phone or my tablet or my laptop, uh, in my hotel, at the airport, et cetera. Um, we also are changing where we, we have not done this too much, um, but larger firms. Uh, especially those in the 500 to 7,000 range, have now relocated back office functions as the financial institutions did a long time ago to low cost geographies. Um, we've relocated our server farm. Unfortunately, we didn't put it in Iceland where I'd like to visit. It's in Utah, uh, but it's next to the NSA one, so we figure it's more secure there. <laughs> um, and it was primarily a security uh, move um, but also it's cheaper to put it in Utah than it is in downtown Los Angeles or San Francisco where we have offices. Uh, when we do things, well that's just like where we do things, we do it around the clock. You can always get a word processor, you can always um, produce a document, do research, uh, nothing's ever closed. Um, maybe more interesting uh, to the audience, lawyers used to depend on, on two sources of information a relatively finite body of law, published statutes, codes, regulations, et cetera, and published decisions from appellate courts that created precedent in their jurisdiction. And even that was too much to get through. Um, and then the second source of law was really what I'll call local knowledge or inside baseball or whatever your favorite thing is. Somebody had five cases in front of that judge and could get a new client because that was more than anyone else and knew that judge's proclivities, okay? And a law firm could stockpile that local knowledge in each of their offices uh, and make it accessible, technology helped, 
Um, and that's what we knew. We now have, we'll start with litigation or court processes for a minute. It's not uniform yet, but it's getting there. Uh, it's, it's by sections of law, but essentially every filing, anything any lawyer ever files with any court seeking any judicial action will eventually be in a database that's searchable. And probably for cheap. So a lawyer's job of predicting an outcome used to be primarily understanding the law, taking into account the human proclivities of the judge, and collecting some local knowledge. Now you have big data tools to analyze every decision that judge has ever made. And it's far more predictive in accuracy than the law. Um, the good news is it hasn't yet happened in my uh, lifetime uh, where I have to know how to use the big data tools. I hire people to do that. And it's not yet uniform across uh, jurisdictions. But I've forgotten the statistics. It's not my practice area. But something like 50% of IP disputes, patents, et cetera, take place in uh, one jurisdiction in Texas. And uh, a, out, a, a legal service provider, not a law firm, has scanned every document ever filed in that courthouse. And you can subscribe to their service so you can predict the outcome of your cases. And that's now necessary if you're going to compete in that marketplace. It's not enough to know that you're right. That's always been the case for lawyers. But now it's even more so. Um, Watson would be able to pour through that database much faster than an associate okay? once it's trained. So this is the other thing that's happening in the service industry. These, these, we've been requested, uh, we've yet to say yes, other law firms have, to teach software or robots how to do what we do. Because they can't learn on their own. And then, of course, they'll do it instead. Um, so it seems to me to be sort of foolish to do that, but, but people are. Um, so the other thing that technology has changed um, is what we do. Um, it used to be a big case or a big transaction. Everything was done in the law firm soup to nuts, including the photocopy okay, in the old days. Um, obviously, that got outsourced quickly. Uh, but now, um, document review, you're in a big lawsuit. Think about the, it used to be, you know, if you got a subpoena for communications between the parties to a contract dispute, it was a bunch of letters and the draft contracts. Now it's every email, phone call, voicemail, that all has to be produced. The volume of information has grown dramatically. And service providers who can comb through it with smart algorithms, you tell them what you're interested in, they search through, you know, a, ro a room this size of filled with beacons boxes of digital equivalent documents, and they can do that much faster than lawyers. Uh, and they use lawyers in-house in those companies and a lot of non-lawyers. Um, so law firms that were built on a pyramid model of having, you know, five associates working on every lawsuit because they were needed to go through the documents now need one. Um, and so, um, uh, that's changed. And, and then um, what else don't we do anymore much of? Um, the intersecting with expert witnesses, the creation of displays. You may be, when I, was, when I started out, I did a trial where I actually used a flip chart and wrote notes, and I actually created them in the courtroom. But it was always, you know, I was always taught if you can hear something and see it at the same time, the the decider will remember more. Okay, so now we have automation displays. You need to be, you need to have talent on your team that understands essentially how to make everything you present in a courtroom, especially to a jury, look like a television show, because they're used to getting information from either the internet or TV. That's the most easily processed information they get. Doesn't matter if you're actually going to go over a table of numbers that proves that the forecast was wrong. You need to have a newscaster sitting in front of a desk with some blips. The newscaster better be an expert or it doesn't count. But uh, you gotta package the information the way a jury can receive it. 
Okay, so all sorts of new skill sets there, right? The, by the way, the forecast is right. <laughs> of course it is, but if we saw it on TV, we'd believe it more. And that shouldn't be it, true, but it is. Uh, our, our, our next panelist to uh, uh, David's right uh, is Elizabeth Brink. Uh, Elizabeth is Senior Strategist and Southwest Regional Director of Consulting for Gensler. And by the way, Gensler is building, is designing the seventh Anderson building, uh, which is going to be right out here and apparently take my parking space. Uh, <laughs> but, but Elizabeth promises not. Uh, Elizabeth has a, a strong background in advising uh, clients on new offices and how to work with this uh, new distributed, geographically distributed uh, labor force. Uh, her uh, undergraduate degree is, um, is from Princeton University and she has a graduate degree in architecture from UCLA. Uh, so uh, Elizabeth, uh, both in your business and, and in your consulting, that is in your architecture business and in, in consulting and the clients that you advise, they have to deal with outsourcing in this distributed workforce and we heard a lot about that in our, in our keynote. Can you talk about that some and, and how uh, that's changing and how that's changing kind of the skills that people need and, and you know, kind of what the modern workforce, the 21st century workforce, uh, from your perspective is going to be uh, uh, requiring. Yes, um, so we literally get to do the moving the furniture around in response to that lovely Pac-Man diagram. So that's what we spend a lot of our time doing. And like Jerry said, you know, one of the things that we're really seeing is um, technology is enabling sort of a new type of high performance teaming where, where groups of consultants and you know, people in different geographic regions are really coming together. And the office itself is becoming sort of the nexus for enabling that. So it, it's a place not only where physically and virtually these teams can come together and interact with one another um, in a more high performance sort of way. So it's not just about an email, it's about how do you bump up the quality of that engagement, how do you bring people together into a space where they can connect with one another, um, not just about transferring the information, but really about understanding and problem solving together in a more creative way. Um, in, our, in our business, we're seeing technology, um, BIM services, building information management. It's really one central repository of all the information from architects, structural engineers, mechanical engineers, the city, the surveyors, all come together into one repository. And the team itself works around that sort of single entity, that, that sort of physical model. And all the information goes there. And everyone has to learn how to engage with that model you know, much earlier in the process. It used to be we all sort of did our own little bit of the process and then came together at the end and reconciled everything. But now, you know, the physical model becomes where all that information is held and everyone has to sort of transition how they interact with that and how they interact with one another. So what it's driving, at least in our industry, is a different level of communication. Some of those soft skills um, in terms of collaboration, communication, the ability to speak in many different languages, technical language, human language, business language, engineering language, um, they're all sort of different languages. And that ability to translate between those languages is becoming an increasingly important skill um, that we're seeing. Okay, thank, thank you. And our next panelist is uh, James Peters, who is uh, Vice President of New Market In Initiatives for uh, LegalZoom. Uh, James received his BA in Political Science uh, and International Relations from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, a JD from the University of Michigan, and an MBA from UCLA. And uh, so, w welcome home. Thank you. Uh, and um, <coughs> three football powers, right? Yes. <laughs> at, at one point. <laughs> Each. Uh, so, so um, James, you, you're working at uh, kind of the forefront of this new technology, and maybe you can talk some about where you see this going. Uh, I mean, I know as part of your work is uh, lawyers without walls and, 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 right. and, and the like, and so uh, kind of a, this brave new world. Yeah, um, one thing just, just out of curiosity, if 
Maybe just a quick show of hands of people who are familiar with LegalZoom. Okay, pretty good number, but just for those who are not, we are a provider of online legal services. We target really families and small businesses. So where David's firm is more corporate by nature, we are more of a consumer focused firm. Um, LegalZoom started sort of at a point where that's come up a lot of times today, which is really providing services to consumers via automation, um, or at least standardization. So taking very commonly used um, legal forms and creating a questionnaire behind them that a consumer could access on their own to create their own legal forms. That was sort of the, the genesis of the company quite a long time ago now, actually 15 years ago. Um, we have migrated since then, actually, in sort of opposite direction, um, which is kind of up the scale, and moved away from things that are pure automation, pure technology focused, to more ways of integrating lawyers and actual legal help with that technology. Um, so one thing that a lot of people in the US know is that we actually do have a law firm in the UK now. Um, the United Kingdom has done a lot to liberalize the regulation of legal services, and it allows non-lawyers to own firms, uh, which is having some very interesting effects over there. So when you hear things like, would you go to Google for your banking? In the UK, they have very real questions. Would you actually like to go to the co-op for your legal services? Would you like your accounting firm to also provide your legal services? You can get things bundled together and in one place. That's not so much technology focused, but I think some of the changes that have occurred with technology have spurred that movement um, in other areas. I think from, from my perspective, um, the, the really important part of technology when it comes to consumer legal services is actually, it's, it's not automation necessarily and it's not price. I think it's the reduction of friction in purchasing services. So this has come up a couple of times today too. When people look at purchasing professional services, I think there's a, there are a lot of them where they look at it and say, why is this harder than anything else I do in my everyday life? Why do I have to wait for a lawyer to return my phone calls? Um, you know, why can't I see what's going on with my legal documents? Why don't I know what it's going to cost me before I go in to actually make this purchase? So, Part of the impact of technology, strictly in transitioning from sort of a brick and mortar and um, you know, book bound, the traditional firm that David was mentioning, to an online world, which sounds very 1990s, but is actually quite present. It's today for legal services. That shift didn't really happen um, as early as it did for some other industries. So moving to online is, presenting consumers with the opportunity to make purchases of legal services in a way that they're much more comfortable with because it matches up with their everyday experience for other things. It shouldn't be more painful for me to go and get a will than it is for me to buy anything else in the world, but it has been traditionally. So that to me is the really big, the big impact in consumer services. I do a lot of work um, with Law Without Walls and it's a great program that brings together schools from all over the world, uh, business and law schools, to tackle projects, basically. And I work with law students a fair amount. So when I talk to them about things that they might want to be focused on, if they want to be prepared for what's coming in legal services, I usually focus on a few things. I think the first is the ability to be a sort of multidisciplinary collaborative individual. So the students who are on these teams that are multinational and cross-functional and working out real problems, I think have, have a bit of an edge from the start. So that, that's an important factor. I think there's a really interesting development of new jobs in law that are focused around people who understand both the law and process. Um, systema, systematizing legal needs is huge right now both in the consumer space and the corporate space, being able to provide a more efficient and often more um, accurate outcome. So you'll see law firms now uh, that have postings for jobs that are things like a legal architect position, 
um, a legal solutions expert, things like that, that you never would have seen a while ago. You also see people hiring chief strategy officers for law firms, um, things of that nature that are totally different. And I think, you know, really while some of those elements aren't necessarily rooted fundamentally in just technology, it's the access that technology is providing to the world as a whole that is making law firms realize we better start thinking about making some changes before it's too late. So really when you look at any sort of profession, the sort of core of a profession is the fact that you are an expert in some sort of information that is too much for the everyday person to be able to incorporate into life. So you might take a look at law as one example where you say there's so much going on in the world, how could I possibly understand everything legal related when a need comes up? Same thing with you know, accounting and medicine. And all of these are seeing shifts in what's kind of the way people view that gatekeeper function because of technology. So you've got LegalZoom on the legal side, you've got you know, TurboTax for many years on the accounting side, you've got WebMD on the medical side. Um, and these, these are big changes. So you can't rely on <coughs> a barrier anymore <coughs> where you say, look, just because I have license to use this knowledge, I'll be in a position where I have a good job in the future. So you've got to either be somebody who can work within the new contours of the system um, and really do understand process and the ability to be business focused and multidisciplinary, <coughs> or I think for at least a good number of years, you can be a very, very good student at a very good school, and you'll have no problem getting a good job. So those are your two options, essentially, if you're going into uh, particularly law, but I think a lot of professions, really. Yeah, so, so, so to that point, uh, Uday said that, uh, that we, acad uh, we in uh, academia, that that's almost gone, but I like the almost. <laughs> Uh, our, our next panelist is Dr. Karine Vendersky. She is Associate Professor of Management and Organizations here at UCLA, uh, Anderson. And um, uh, Corinne's research, she tries to understand new phenomena that are generally studied in isolation and or static constructs uh, and how they function differently when they're examined in group and organizational context as dynamically evolving processes. So, so it's very much to the point of what we're talking about in terms of what are these, not just what do these organizations look like, but how do they function and what does that mean? Uh, Corrine received her PhD at uh, MIT's Sloan School of Management and her bachelor's degree with honors from Oberlin College. And in addition to teaching here in uh, our MBA program at UCLA Anderson, she is faculty director for the Heart Program, an experienced mediator facilitator of group decisions and developer of effective uh, learning processes. So, uh, Kareen, what uh, I, I'd like you to uh, address in the opening remarks is about the modern workplace, and it's now culturally, as demographically, as geographically uh, diverse, and uh, it's allowed us to bring people together in kind of this virtual, uh, the virtual and flexible work environment. Uh, and in your research, you've examined some of these dynamics, and perhaps you can uh, share some of the insights uh, to that. Sure. So, as I've been listening, in my research, I ask a lot of these questions, and in the classes, uh, I talk to my students frequently about their experiences in teams, particularly virtual teams, distributed teams, global teams, cross-functional teams, excuse me. And uh, listening today to our speakers, the idea of about what technologies are substituting for, what they're facilitating, what they're enabling, and when, what some of the costs in terms of our organization, particularly our team effectiveness, uh, we might be incurred, incurring with the high level of technology and uh, use of virtual, did I just go out of, I'm okay? No. Uh, and use of virtual technologies for how we interact with organizations. And one of the big costs, potentially, that I'm very concerned about when I see the level of uh, technological substitution for jobs that have become very modularized um, requires people to work very autonomously. 
And what we lose with that level of autonomization and modularization are the social connections that have for ever <laughs> been the source of a lot of innovation, creativity, loyalty, connection, sense of purpose of being a part of an organization. And uh, HART is the Human Resources Roundtable Association, so I spent a lot of time talking to senior HR executives, and they bemoan, what do we do with these millennials these days? They're all so mobile. We can't you know, keep any of them in our organizations. We don't know what to do. Well, what attracts people to organizations and creates a sense of loyalty and commitment is feeling like you're engaged in a purpose that's greater than what you can accomplish by yourself. That requires some level of social connection, social engagement. And so uh, on the one hand, while virtual technologies have enabled great expansion in the breadth of teams, right? We can now have people on our teams from around the globe. It doesn't necessarily enhance the quality of our interactions with the people on our teams. And in fact, there's a great deal of evidence that uh, relying almost, the more exclusively we rely on virtual teaming interactions, the lower the quality of the effectiveness of our teams. And that has a lot to do with what goes on outside of the tech window. What's going on in the context of which our teammates are working that helps us understand and make attributions for their behaviors, their statements, their deliverables, or the lack thereof. Um, it also reduces the kind of spontaneous, opportunistic um, ideas and, and problem solving and um, creative insights that occur in more natural and organic, unscheduled interactions. So on the, one in, on the one hand, it increases the quality of the diversity of uh, inputs we have into our team and process. On the other hand, if you have the capability to have you know, a hands-on team meeting that has all 50 members of your globally distributed team present at the same time, that doesn't mean that you're actually having a high quality engagement and interaction with all of those members, and chances are the vast majority of them are present only on uh, in, in avatar form and not actually present themselves. And so any use of, uh, increased use of technology and virtual reality, virtual teaming needs to be sh um, married by some kind of processes that facilitate and enable ongoing social connections, deeper understanding of the, the context, the contextual knowledge of our team members, recognizing that those things are lost often in our reliance on virtual technologies, and without them, there are many potential benefits and um, positive outcomes that we're sort of giving up by relying so much on teams and, uh, excuse me, on, by, on virtual technology and more autonomy rather than team interaction. Great, so uh, we are a bit short on time and there are two questions that I really want to get to and, and, and uh, get your insights on, so I'm gonna combine them. Uh, and, uh, and then everyone can weigh in on them. And the, uh, the first has been kind of running through this conference, uh, which is uh, where are we headed? Are we headed to kind of this barbell economy with some very highly productive people and uh, so now I'm streaming my Terry Gilliam or Ridley Scott, but, um, and, and just a whole bunch of really poor people doing gardening work. Or is this going to be uh, something where technology is gonna raise us eventually, raise us all up to be more productive, wealthier, and have more leisure time? So that's kind of one thing, and so I'm gonna ask you to, to uh, uh, make a forecast or kind of uh, give some views as to where this might be going. And um, so, so that's the, uh, the first question. And the second question, so we just have a new class of MBAs. They're uh, MBA uh, class of 17, just finishing up their first quarter. Given kind of all the things that are happening, and, and Uday addressed uh, some of the, this question, uh, w how would you advise them uh, if they were, in terms of preparing to go into these various kinds of fields and be successful and move up the management chain to be senior managers. So those kind of fit together and kind of don't, but let me uh, throw them out for discussion amongst our panel. And who would? 
I can yes, speak to the first one a little bit, which okay. is a question of, so what's the future of the nature of work and the impact of technology on our wealth and leisure? And I can say technology is probably going to make us all richer, but it sure isn't going to give us more free time. Um, any of us who have tried to take a vacation without leaving our devices behind knows that technology does not enhance and increase our free time. It encroaches on our free time, or it allows our work to encroach on our free time. And I think that's actually something that uh, we're already very much in the thick of, and we, we need to make decisions about how we're going to kind of reclaim our non-work lives by controlling our access to technology in a more um, in a more controlled way. I can't think of a better word for that. But where we're taking ownership over the in, uh, over the interactions, uh, our technologically facilitated interactions. Um, I also do think that there is a potential, the barbell that uh, is very likely to emerge, but not necessarily the kind that you describe. I think we're going to see a, lot, a big different differentiation between people who are embedded in organizations and have jobs that are part of the kind of the social structure of the organizations that I was talking about previously, and the micro workers who are going to be taking over a lot of those tasks that can be modularized and either automi automated or um, um, given to people outside of the organization who don't actually have long-standing connections with the organization itself. And that's going to be two very different kind of classes of employment in our, in our future. I think that there's um, something that's going to be very different for this new class of MBAs that you're talking about um, than maybe for some of the people in this room um, in terms of that balance between work and life and free time and technology. Because already, I think you see, they're sort of native technology speakers that grew up using all of this. And there's, there's not really a difference between free time and work time for them. So when you see people, you know, they're Facebooking as they're working, and that's you know, social and building connections. But at the same time, they're working in the middle of the night on a conference call with you know, someone in Bangalore or, or somewhere else. And so I think in that way, they do have sort of those native skills where they can just sort of seamlessly utilize technology. Um, and they may end up burning out, but what they probably need to do is then sort of recalibrate with some of the face-to-face -face, um, interaction skills and you know that sort of relationship building skills that maybe they're, they're losing because they're more on their devices. So I think that's maybe where they need to put some time in growing those kind of relationship skills and those kind of team building skills to move up to be more successful. I, go ahead. I was say, in law, I think, you are already seeing a <coughs> bifurcation of the profession into a barbell of sorts. So there are a lot of new lawyers who are working in basically document review factories now, those operations headquarters in lower cost places. And reality is they're not gaining any skills to move them up the ladder, unless they're doing it on their own, working with a mentor or something of that nature. So where do those people go in five years? That's a pretty big question mark, I think, for the profession. And if you are looking at something that is essentially, I am the pair of human eyes that checks off what a computer did for me, how long does that last as a job? Um, I'd say it's a, it's a little bit suspect, but I, I throw in some optimism for law and maybe some other professions in that there's also a huge, huge surge of people going out and starting new things in law. So if I've been doing sort of speaking on this kind of stuff for five or six years. When I started, there were almost no companies that self-proclaimed to be legal on, uh, like AngelList, if you're familiar with that. There are now over a 1,000 that self-identify as a legal startup. So there's a lot going on in the space, and there are a lot of problems to be solved. And where there are problems to be solved, there are good opportunities for people who are capable of handling those kinds of problems. So, and, and in law in particular, we also have massive underserved needs. Uh, something, general numbers thrown around are that 85% of people who encounter legal needs don't actually ever get legal help for them. So there's opportunity, but it's not in the traditional practice. So let me, let me come at this uh, from a different direction. I, I, I think, um, the value of, of uh, people skills, if I can use a non-technical term, uh, is uh, on the rise. 
um, notwithstanding we spent the whole morning talking about impacts of technology and automation, et cetera. If I were uh, an MBA student today or a law student today, trying to uh, hone the skills that include emotional intelligence, empathy, uh, communication, humor, um, um, uh, quick judgment, um, creating an aura of confidence, all the sort of things that a machine can't do, that people who are called upon to help someone with a problem, legal or otherwise, um, need to do to get the problem solved, even if they're deploying machines to do 90% of the lifting. Um, and those sort of attributes were not traditional in the law school curriculum, or, and I don't know the MBA curriculum, but I, I doubt it uh, to the extent that they're gonna be valued in the future. So I, I would encourage everyone to, to focus a little bit on that. The optimist's perspective of the half-empty glass is that technology is fastest taking over jobs where you can actually describe step-by-step step what it takes to do it. You can teach, if you can teach somebody exactly what steps to follow to bake a cake or to do a calculation, you can teach a machine to do it. And a lot of jobs have a lot of that repetition in them. As that piece of your work goes away, the remaining aspect of your job should be the more interesting aspect. It's not repetitive. It's not check the, law, the list. It's judgment. Uh, go to law for a moment. It's in, imperfectly informed judgment where there's never enough time to get a better judgment. Um, and so I think less lawyers will be involved and their jobs will be more interesting in, in the sector that, that, that uh, the big law firms uh, practice in. More non-lawyers will be involved uh, and a lot of them will need MBA degrees. There's organizational science that law firms and others uh, who, were, uh, who you know, were designed 200 years ago in the artisan style uh, will need assistance with process engineering, you know, tracking things, all sorts of data analysis. But at the end of the day, the lawyer's job will still be primarily, and now they'll maybe get to do more of it, the giving of advice uh, when there's not a black and white answer. It's just a variety of shades of gray and you need, your client needs to have confidence in you, you need to be able to communicate, you need to be um, viewed as a collaborator with your client, you're not just selling them something and done with it. Um, so partnering skills are, are key. And I, I fear for society. For, <laughs> the 1% is gonna be wealthy and 99% are not. Aren't they already? <laughs> I think that's right. And technology's not helping. Uh, I, uh, unfortunately, we're actually, uh, we, we've held you over a, a little bit, so we'll have to bring this to a close. But um, in, in hearing our panel today and the earlier discussion, uh, you know, what occurs to me, I teach uh, a class in international business and it's focused on Asia and there are a lot of big changes going on in, in Asia today. And what I try and get my students to focus on is when you have lots of change going on, there's much more risk, but there's also much more opportunity. And it sounds like as we move forward to this brave new world, uh, that both are the case. So please join me in thanking this uh, great panel.